They were celebrity deaths that terrified Tinseltown. It is a real-life murder mystery. Some were shocking. He had brutalized her and then taken her cat and dismembered it. And for others, mysteries still remain. Everything around it is suspicious. Join me, Scott Michaels, and my friend, Scream Queen, Danielle Harris, as we walk you in the terrifying footsteps of killers and their victims. She woke up to this man on top of her. So lock your doors and windows. We're about to take you on a Hollywood death trip. My name is Scott Michaels, and I'm the owner of Dearly Departed Tours in Hollywood. The guy was doing what we now know is autoerotic asphyxiation, which is strangling yourself while you masturbate, as you do. If you want to see the creepy side of Hollywood, I'm the guy. So this is a spot where all the crazy that went down 38 years ago tonight. There is a thing of human remains. Nobody does horror better than Hollywood. So on today's tour, joining me will be one of Tinseltown's scream queens. My name is Danielle Harris. I'm what's known as the final girl in horror movies. I've always been really fascinated with uh, true crime, death, horrible things. Knock, knock. Hey. <laughs> Hi. How's it going? Good. The place looks awesome. It's creepy cool. I like it. Uh, I've acquired a couple of more things since you were here the last time. I'm not surprised. Scott's a little, um, I hate to use the word obsessed, <laughs> but um, maybe enamored by death is a better way to look at it. Show me what you got. Um, OK, that is that wooden post that you see. That's from the bed that Rock Hudson died in in 1985. I don't have the mattress, because that would be crossing a That's line. That's creepy, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that is Sharon Tate's fireplace. That freaks me out a little bit. It, um, and it should. <laughs> I've always said I wanted to be a homicide detective if I was not an actress. So this is kind of like in the back door to really investigate some true crime, gritty, awful cool things. This is different than the movies. This is real, and this is scary. Well, what are we doing? What do you got, what do you got planned for me? I have assembled a tour for you, especially, mm -hmm. uh, of five different individuals. Some mm -hmm. of them were murder victims. Some of them were just tragic ends. So if you're set to go. I'm set to go. All right, let me grab my jacket. Take me on the tour. Let us depart. Should you leave your taser? You're going to take that with us. <laughs> oh, god, here we go. <laughs> and so it begins. Our first story on the tour involves a guy named Johnny Lewis from Sons of Anarchy who absolutely flipped one day. And what he did that day is unbelievable. It's fun to play the hopeless romantic, you know? It's fun to live in that world. Johnny Lewis was a talented young actor who was most famous for his role as Half Sack on Sons of Anarchy. Despite his promising talents, he was haunted by behavioral issues and granted leave from the hit show. After that, his problems only increased, and he was repeatedly arrested and jailed for assault and drug charges. I wonder if over the years if I've met him. I know he used to date Katy Perry, right? Yeah, they were together for about a year, and apparently it was a, a bit, well, it was an ugly breakup. We're heading up to where uh, Johnny Lewis lived. Catherine Davis had this house uh, that's been named the Writer's Villa, and it was sort of a boarding house for a lot of up-and-coming actors. Uh, Val Kilmer lived there, Parker Posey lived there, and it was a gathering place, a friendly place. These people could sort of, you know, hang out together or party together. They say that George Clooney was a fixture at the house as well, uh, well known to everyone that lived there. Just a place where people could feel comfortable going in and out, and, uh, and she was the den mother to this crowd. You will see and hear from someone who was actually there an amazing recount of what happened. This is where September 26th of 2012, it was about 10.30 in the morning, that the neighbors heard Catherine Davis screaming. Uh, and by the time the police arrived, Lewis was dead. He had uh, jumped off that railing and landed in the driveway. A shocking end for a rising actor in Los Angeles. Johnny Lewis beat his 81-year-old landlady to death, attacked two other men nearby, then fell or jumped to his own death from the roof. This is uh, an actual crime scene photograph, and you can see 
exactly where Lewis hit the ground. Johnny's body was lying face up when emergency personnel found him. His skull was crushed above his left eye. Catherine Davis was discovered in the bedroom. She was strangled and suffered blows to the head with a hammer exposing her brain. In the master bathroom, the body of her cat, Jessie, was discovered. Its head bashed in so severely that its eye popped out of the socket. Any idea where, uh, where he was the night before, what he was doing? And... He was sober. I mean, there was nothing in the system. When you do an autopsy report, they're pretty thorough with toxicology and uh, Nothing, no alcohol, no drugs, nothing. No, absolutely nothing. Nothing. I wonder if this is, may sound like a morbid question, but I wonder if the driveway's stained at all. As I understand it, they paid a grand to, to have it cleaned off. I, wow. I could have done it for 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great house, though, isn't it? Well, before somebody was brutally murdered here, then I would say it was a great house, right? I don't really know if, uh, if I'm getting that warm, fuzzy feeling, Scott. Actually, we, we have an interview set up with Daniel Blackburn, and he's the guy that Johnny Lewis uh, attacked before going back in and literally going off the rail over there. So uh, he's uh, going to speak to us. Let's check it out. Massive anxiety already. Yeah, I know. I just feel weird. After brutally slaying Davis and her cat, Lewis climbed these stairs and attacked her neighbor and a painter who was working on the neighbor's house. Here we go. Hello. Hello, Mr. Blackburn. Hi. Scott Michaels. Nice to meet you, Danielle Scott. Harris. Danielle. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for taking a few minutes to share sure. with us. Could you uh, walk us through what happened? Sure. The whole thing kind of starts over this way, and uh, and it moves back and forth. It's sort of a, 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 an event in motion. Take me back through it. So your wife calls for mm -hmm. you. You come I downstairs. I come down the stairs. He's beating He's up the painter. He's beating up the painter. And then you I come put, out. I put my hand on his shoulder. OK. And to pull him back. He came up on his feet and hit me before I had a chance to even react. Wow. And I picked up one of these benches. There's a reason there's only three of them. I broke the fourth one on him. He looked at me like, why are you bothering me? And I intended to kill him. Coming up, the bloody and horrific last minutes of Johnny Lewis's life. No one who was here that day believes that. Then, Brittany Murphy's dad reveals why he thinks there was foul play in his daughter's death. You thought that Mon Jack had something to do with Brittany's death. And later, the gruesome murder of a beautiful Playboy playmate. It looked like a horror movie that was staged. On Hollywood Death Trip. I'm taking scream queen Danielle Harris on a tour of Hollywood deaths. We just saw the crime scene where Johnny Lewis killed his landlady and fell to his death. Now we've joined Daniel Blackburn, Johnny's neighbor, as he recounts how he narrowly escaped becoming one of Johnny's victims. Take me back through it. So your wife calls for you. You come I downstairs. I come down the stairs, and I picked up one of these benches. There's a reason there's only three of them. I broke the fourth one on him. I hit him right in the temple. It had no effect, and I intended to kill him. We ran in the house. All well, three of you, the yeah. painter and The plan neighbor. was we'd slam the door and be safe, right. and one of us would call 911. Right. Well, the plan didn't quite work. He put his arm in here, like like this, yeah, okay. to keep us from closing the door. So and you slammed it on his hand, on his so arm. On it, we slammed it on his forearm. Wow. Fourth time that we slammed it on him. He did finally pull it back, but at no point did he indicate that he was in any pain of any kind. And then he took off and from here and ran really fast right to the fence, and he just flew over it. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. He okay. just, like like this, and, and lands on that fence. No kidding. You stayed in your house at still at this point, or did until you come they, out? Until I saw the cops had come out, and they asked, you know, what's going on? And I said, just because of instinct, I said, I think there's real trouble in that house. Something I think very bad has happened. And so they sent a couple of officers into the house as he had just brutalized her and, and then taken her cat and dismembered it. The coroner's report says no evidence of drugs or right. toxicity at all. Right. The police said to me when they were here that they'd gone into his apartment there and found drugs, the, the stuff for uh, bath salts and, and, and happy drug. The speculation is that Johnny was using bath salts, a synthetic drug that looks similar to Epsom salts. Users have been known to experience hallucination and paranoia and exhibit intensely violent behavior. Bath salts do not show up in drug testing. It's a mystery to me that they could have reached the conclusion they did because no one who was here that day believes that. No one. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank nice you. Talking to you. Lock your door. 
Yes, ma'am. <laughs> as an actor, Johnny Lewis showed a lot of promise, but as a man, he was tortured by all kinds of inner demons. A crippling addiction problem, as well as mental health issues, drove him to commit the grisly murder of an elderly woman and the macabre dismemberment of her cat. Johnny's trail of brutality ended in his own violent death. That's the first time I had ever heard of bath salts or whatever the hell they're called. Wasn't there somebody else that, like, ate the fate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when I first heard of them. Yeah, else. that guy ta attacked somebody like... to chew his face off. <laughs> I love that how you think that that's funny. Insane. As horrific as Johnny Lewis's story was, I'm afraid this one might be more upsetting for you because we're going to be talking about Brittany Murphy. I know you were a friend of hers. Um... We were friends when we were uh, little girls, actually. In, like 12, 13, I think it was when we became friends. She moved out here from New York just shortly after I did for pilot season. And we had the same manager and went to school together. We had our little, like, click, you know? Brittany Murphy was a 32-year-old actress who had it all. Money, fame, a hunky husband. Well, two out of three ain't bad. Born in Atlanta, Brittany was raised in New Jersey before coming to L.A. with her mother, Sharon, to pursue an acting career. She would go on to star in many pop culture hits, including 8 Mile, Clueless, and Girl Interrupted. My ears are popping. That's how high up we are. They say every time your ears pop, you can add a million bucks to the price tags on these places. Well, the house actually uh, was destroyed a couple of years ago. We're going to where it stood actually makes me feel better that it was ripped down. Uh, it was uh, December 20th, 2009, about 7.30 in the morning. Brittany's mother walked into the bathroom and saw Brittany's body on the floor and made this 911 call. I'm sorry. It went off. Nervous. It went off. Maybe we're not supposed to play it. <laughs> Fire to Byway 97 was the address of the emergency. Crazy Glen Road. Tell me exactly what happened. Oh, they got us passed out. She's, she's, they're doing, we're doing mouth to mouth. Please get oh, here oh, quick, okay. please. Okay, okay, ma'am. Did somebody see what happened? No. <laughs> okay, she's with you now? Yes, there's someone coming. Yeah, ma'am, you don't have to yell. We're going to send somebody out there, okay? Is she awake? Please, no. Is she breathing? No. I don't know what to say. I had actually not heard that. <laughs> Paramedics arrived shortly afterwards, and she was taken to Cedar sinai Hospital, where she was pronounced dead at 10.05 AM. The official cause of death was acquired pneumonia. Anemia with multiple drug intoxication was also listed as a cause of death. Six months later, Brittany's husband, Simon Monjack, would die in the house that was right there of the exact same thing. We're going to meet someone with a unique view of what may have happened to both victims. Brittany's dad. Hello, sir. How you doing? I'm Scott. Scott, how you doing, Nice Scott? to meet you. This is Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Hi. How are you? Have you, uh, have you been back to the house? No, not since uh, the tragedy. Can you tell me what Brittany was like? She, she was a sweet kid. Uh, kind, as kind as you can get. Uh, she just was a, a perfect little lady since the day she was born. When was the last time you saw Brittany? Uh, approximately four months before she died. Forgive me for launching into this. How do you think that Brittany passed away? Uh, she, I believe she was murdered. Coming up, the untimely death of Simon Monjack. Natural causes or something more sinister? They both died of the exact same thing. And let's face it, the odds on that, you probably wouldn't bet 10 cents. Then, midnight murder in Beverly Hills. The mysterious death of publicist to the stars, Ronnie Chasen. It doesn't make any sense to me. And later, we recount the creepy details of the last night of Ashley Ellerin's short life. She was last known alive at 10.15, and something horrible happened in that 30 minutes. All next on... Danielle Harris and I are talking to A.J. Bertolotti, Brittany Murphy's father, and he's just dropped a shocking revelation. How do you think that Brittany passed away? Uh, I believe she was murdered. By whom? 
I wish I knew by whom, but it's within the circle. Like Monjack, they both died of the exact same thing. And let's face it, the odds on that, you probably wouldn't bet 10 cents. Right. There was something that came up that I thought was unusual. After Brittany died, there were stories about Sharon and Simon, and they were insinuating a romantic relationship. I believe it. Do you? Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. But yet, Monjack, I uh, sort of uh, forgave in a way, but uh, because he died, like I said, from the exact same thing she did. You thought that uh, Monjack was, had something to do with Brittany's death? I think he was involved in it, yeah. But, but then why would he die of the same thing? Then he got the dirty end of it, see? Because he, he went away, too. You're painting a, a rather sinister uh, picture. It's just a case of, of, of getting it off my head, if I could, and uh, seeing that she does get justice. Uh, she deserves it. Thank you. Pleasure. AJ's allegations of a relationship between Sharon and Simon is his take on the situation. Sharon Murphy has refuted the rumor that she and Simon were romantically involved and called the allegations disgusting. We're going to head downtown right now to the LA County Coroner's Office where we're going to meet my friend Craig Harvey, who's the chief of operations. And Craig is going to provide details about what was exactly in Britney's system. How do you, uh, how'd you become friends with the coroner? <laughs> believe it or not, he respects what I do. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it, I believe it. Is this your first time, though, to the uh, uh, coroner's office? Yes, it is my first time. And you I, won't forget it, I the promise you. The next time, I bet you I won't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Hello, Scott. Steve. How, how are you doing? doing? Good to see you. This hi. is Danielle. Hi. Danielle, nice hi. Nice to meet you. Please come in. Shall we? Thank you. Danielle actually has a lot of interest in this case because she was, she was friends with Brittany. What was her official cause of death? Her official cause of death was community-acquired pneumonia. And she had what's known as an other condition or other significant condition, and that was anemia. Mm -hmm. Those were the things that the medical examiner felt were her cause of death. Can you explain to me how anemia kills somebody? In this case, it didn't kill her, right. it contributed to her death. We're talking about somebody who probably didn't take the best care of herself. Not eating properly and getting sick a lot, working too much. Right. And uh, what drugs were found in her system? Um, there were a lot of different drugs found in her system, right. but they were at therapeutic or sub-therapeutic levels. What does that mean? The levels indicate that the drug was used recently but it wasn't necessarily the cause of death. Mm -hmm. She had pneumonia, she had trouble breathing, mm -hmm. and uh, that is probably what ultimately claimed her life. There's no she like cocaine. You know, there were so many rumors over the years that she got so skinny because of drug use. And, and I, as well as I knew her, never saw her not excited and not happy. And I cannot imagine for one moment that she would be someone that would do cocaine. Right. So, and, and that, that wasn't found. Simon Monjek died such a short period of time after Brittany Murphy did of the same thing. Community acquired pneumonia, I believe, was was Simon. Did they get it from each other? Probably not, because there was significant time between the two deaths. Five months. I hadn't talked to her for a couple of years uh, before she passed away, so. Curious, I don't have access to this stuff. Obviously, I get to read what everybody else gets to read. There's the assertion by individuals that she may have been poisoned. We don't test for poisons routinely. If somebody does come to us and say, we think somebody's been poisoned, we ask them to be very specific. And so if we're going to test for poison, then we're going to look for those specific poisons in our uh, test results. Mm. Here you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking time with us. Thank nice you. to meet nice you. To meet you. Well, how you doing? You doing okay? I am, I guess I've been holding that in for a while. <laughs> I'm okay, still a little, whew. Stiff. All right, all right, light me up. This next story on our Hollywood death trip involves lust, greed, beauty, and obsession. 
a little violence as well. Oh yeah, a yeah. little, a little. As an old, <laughs> there's a lot of violence. <laughs> In 1979, Dorothy Stratton came to Hollywood chasing stardom with her husband and manager, Paul Snyder. One year later, Dorothy won Playmate of the Year and was quickly cast in several big screen movies. All seemed rosy at first for the young couple. I think he discovered her when she was about 16 or 17, and he forged her mother's signature on a release to, to send nude photos to Playboy. So, and they saw the photos and bam, Hefner was on it and flew her out here like immediately. So, and she got to where she was, a very successful model, and uh, Snyder just lost it. By most accounts, Paul Snyder was abusive and controlling and Dorothy had had enough. Dorothy was leaving Paul for Peter Bogdanovich, the director of Dorothy's new film. Bogdanovich was one of Hollywood's top directors and had a history of hooking up with his leading ladies. Snyder was enraged by the betrayal you know, clearly losing it, wanted to be with her, more like possess her, right. I think. And the farther away she got from him, the, the more insane it made him. She had some messed up men in her life, you know? I we mean, all do, Scott. <laughs> in 1980, this was the home of Peter Bogdanovich, and Dorothy Stratton had moved in with him. On the morning of August 14th, 1980, Dorothy got in her 67 Mercury and drove out these very gates from this glamorous Bel Air home to meet Paul Snyder for the very last time. She literally drove from the splendor of Bel Air to the squalor of Paul Snyder's apartment right off the freeway. She was gonna end it. This was gonna be it. This is her last meeting. And you can just imagine what was going through her head. I mean, it's probably quite clear he was losing it. So that's their apartment right there. Really? Yeah. Is this it right here? Yeah, this really? is it. This is awful. Right. Nice neighborhood. <laughs> so um, Dorothy's Mercury was parked just outside that door to the right. August 14th, this is the anniversary actually. It happened on this very day. The last time Dorothy Stratton breathed fresh air, she walked through that door and that was the end of it. No one knows for sure what transpired during their meeting. The official version is that Dorothy arrived at noon to make the final break with Snyder, and he lost it. Dorothy was sitting on the corner of the bed when Snyder put a shotgun up to her cheek and pulled the trigger. Half an hour later, he turned the gun on himself and fell on top of it. We have Patty Lowerman, who has first-hand knowledge of it. She's the one to discover the bodies. And today, she's gonna to talk to us for the very first time about that day. Hi, Patty. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. And this is Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Nice, nice to, to meet you. you. It's been 33 years since you've been here, so yes. it's really been since that incident. Yes. And Dorothy and Paul lived here with you. Their room was right down the hallway. What's going on in your mind looking at that? I still have that vision of their bodies. When I walked in and found their bodies, yeah. the roommate and I, we, you know, we walked in. It looked like, like a, to me, a horror movie that was staged. Coming up, the deaths of Dorothy Stratton and Paul Snyder. A murder-suicide or double murder? Questions remain. The first thing Stephen said was, oh my god, it's a mass suicide. Then, the deadly shooting of a powerful Hollywood publicist. Shocking to me that she was able to drive after being shot five times. Then later, we reveal how Ashton Kutcher narrowly avoided becoming the Hollywood River's next victim on Hollywood Death. I'm Scott Michaels, owner of Dearly Departed Tours in Hollywood, where we visit the dark side of the City of Angels. Danielle Harris and I are at the site of the deaths of Dorothy Stratton and her estranged husband, Paul Snyder. Patty Lowerman, Dorothy's former roommate, is recounting the awful details of the night she found the bodies. I still have that vision of their bodies. When I walked in and found their bodies, yeah. the roommate and I, we, you know, we walked in, it looked like like, a, to me, a horror movie that was staged. The other roommate who discovered the bodies was Dr. Stephen Kushner, the owner of the house. All four roommates were regulars at the Playboy Mansion. And right when we opened the door, the first thing Stephen said was, oh my god, it's a mass suicide. So he knew, so... He just said that so quickly. So, Patty, what, what do you personally, what do you think happened in there? 
if he killed himself, I don't think it would have been the way it was. Because if you were on your knees and you had a 12 gauge shot shotgun and you blew the front of your face off, the gun wouldn't land completely underneath you. It would have a kickback and go forward. And it was completely under him. You couldn't even see the weapon unless you moved his body and found the weapon. I think that the whole case was so quick, open and shut case. There's got to be something else that so happened you think in that room. Someone killed her, or someone was hired to kill her. I don't see Paul killing Dorothy, and I just just have the gut feeling that somebody killed Paul. I walked into that thinking that she was going to just be 100% say, walked in, Snyder killed her, he killed himself but she had a totally different opinion about him. Contrary to Patty's belief, the police were quick to conclude that this was a murder-suicide, maybe too quickly. She is the only person I've ever heard in life defend him. After walking in and seeing that, no one should ever, ever, ever have to go through anything like that or see anything like that. We're standing in front of the Chinese theater right now. This beautiful theater opened in 1927. If Hollywood was a religion, this is its church. Now, on November 16th of 2010, they had the premiere for the movie Burlesque here, starring Cher and Christina Aguilera. Also attending that night was a 64-year-old publicist, Ronnie Chasen. Ronnie Chasen, or Veronica Cohen, as she was known to her family, was raised in New York City before moving to LA to pursue a career as a publicist. Ronnie may not have been a celebrity herself, but she controlled access to some of the biggest. She was a publicist who worked for movie studios and major stars such as Michael Douglas and Morgan Freeman. After the premiere at the Chinese Theater, Chasen had invited guests here to the W Hotel, and the after party was held up in Dre Nightclub. When Ronnie got here, she'd have two hours left to live. One of the last things Ronnie Chasen would do in life is sit through burlesque. Ouch. At 12.15, after the premiere party was over with, the W Hotel valet brought her car up here. Mm -hmm. She got into her car right here. And now, as we continue, we're on the route she took, the seven plus miles. She was heading down the Sunset Strip to her Westwood home. As of this point where we are right now, she'd have 20 minutes left to live. She just never saw it coming. It is a real-life murder mystery involving one of the best-known and most powerful publicists in the entire movie business. According to Beverly Hills Police, the official version of Ronnie's murder is that she was gunned down at the intersection of Sunset and Whittier by carjacker Harold Martin Smith. So this is the intersection. We are exactly where she was. Now, at Harold Smith, they say he stashed his bike over there somewhere. And what he probably did was stop her. He was standing in front of her because her window was rolled down. So she probably rolled down her window to say, get the f out of here, because Ronnie got her away. And that's when he opened fire, allegedly. That's supposedly how it transpired. There were no other cars coming this way when she's sitting here. It was weird. No cameras, no other cars, no witnesses, a guy on a bicycle riding through Beverly Hills. It doesn't make any sense to me. Here we are, bam, 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 bam. Ronnie hits the gas, probably instinctively just heading towards her home. Maybe she just wanted to get to get away and get out of there. I would have just hit the gas and gone anywhere. So I don't know why she continued with the left hand turn after she was shot. Her car came to uh, a complete stop when she slammed into that lamppost right there. So the Mercedes was coming down this way and it came to rest right, right here. Actually, she hit that post. The post crumbled, bam. Oh, yeah. Shocking to me that she was able to drive after being shot five times. The weird thing about it is that nobody caught it on camera. All these, you know, mil mega million dollar houses, nobody, nobody had. Nobody has cameras outside. This is like 
How fast do you These have to concrete. be going to get this out of the ground? Yeah, this is concrete. Who's that? Coming up, was Ronnie Chasen the victim of a carjacking or a hitman? Been shot himself in the head at that moment. And later, the Hollywood Ripper's evil aftermath. That morning, I got a phone call from our friend Jack, and he told me that Ashley was dead. Next, we're digging into the murder of Ronnie Chasen, who was brutally gunned down in Beverly Hills. The police suspect the carjacking gone wrong, but now we're about to meet an investigative journalist who believes that the truth is a very different story. Who's that? That's theory number two. Ryan? Hi. Nice to meet you, Scott. Good to meet you, Scott. And this is Danielle. Hi, Hi Danielle. Danielle. So I understand you're a filmmaker. Yes, I am. And your film has a particular interest to us mm -hmm. right now. 638, The Death of Ronnie Chasen. We draw the title of 638 from the 6 minutes and 38 seconds of elapsed time from when Ronnie Chasen hung up the phone call from her second in command at Chasen and Company on the night that she was coming down Sunset to the time when the police got the call saying that there had been a collision on Whittier Drive with a pole and they sent units to the, to the scene of that crash. What is your angle on this? I don't believe personally that the ambush took place at Sunset and Whittier. Really? I think that it took place further down Whittier, just beyond the stop sign. And I think that she immediately lost control of the car and hit the pole pretty quick. So the stop sign closest to where we are right now is where you think she was shot? The reason why I don't believe she was shot at the Sunset and Whittier intersection is because the lights in Beverly Hills on Sunset are designed to facilitate traffic on Sunset, which is a main arterial, as quickly as possible. I ask in the course of my research, the city engineer, is there any scenario at that hour of the night that I could roll up to Sunset and Whittier and be stopped for a long enough period to potentially be robbed? And the city engineer said to me, there's no feasible way, not the way that the lights are structured. Because obviously we've heard the story that Harold Martin Smith shot through the passenger window of the car. Well, we all know that any car window is tempered glass. So when it's hit, it, it shatters into a million pieces. So there should be a corresponding crime scene photo that should demonstrate where the glass was first found. Mm -hmm. Wherever that window first shattered, mm -hmm. that's where she was shot. Beverly Hills Police Department has refused to turn that over, and I find that very peculiar because if you're confident that you've solved a case why wouldn't you share that info where did they come up with his name how did he become a suspect harold martin smith actually came up as the result of a call to the america's most wanted someone at the harvey apartments where harold was staying said that harold had been acting funny that harold was responsible for this crime the police on december 1st went to question harold smith and Harold pulled the revolver out of his jacket pocket and shot himself in the head at that moment. The rumor was that he had stated that he was not going back to prison no matter what, because he was a two strikes felon. He knew when they took him in and they found that gun in his pocket, he knew he was going to go away. Did the bullet that he used to kill himself match what she was shot with? Really good question. We don't know. And the reason that we don't know is because the Beverly Hills Police Department will not release the ballistics report. So there's always the possibility that he might not have been involved at all. Hopefully, uh, the police will release some evidence and we can tie up some of these loose ends, you know? If they release documents pertaining to this, uh, yeah, I think it would satisfy a lot of people and, uh, and Ronnie would be able to rest peacefully. The next and final case is a murder that took place in recent Hollywood history and goes down in history as one of the most gruesome Hollywood crimes. In high school, Ashley Ellerin was described as beautiful, outgoing, and according to friends, always the life of the party. She left home in Northern California to study at the LA Fashion Institute. She had a knack for flirtation, and soon Ashley was dating some of Hollywood's biggest stars like Vin Diesel and Ashton Kutcher. It was her outgoing personality that would lead to a friendship with the alleged Hollywood Ripper. This house we're coming up to on the left is the house that Ashley was renting. Quiet neighborhood. 
the parking lot next door, park across the street, isolated. It was 2001. It was Grammy night, and Ashley was last seen at 10 o'clock. She was getting out of the shower. She was wearing a green terry cloth bathrobe over a tank top and shorts. She was last known alive at 10.15. Something horrible happened in that 30 minutes because at 10.45, Ashton Kutcher came to pick her up to take her to a post-Grammy party. It was going to be their first date. Ashton walked up those stairs and walked up to that front door and knocked on the door. She didn't answer, so he looked in the window. He didn't see anything on the inside. He walked around the left side of the house, and it was you know, a dark pathway. He peeked into the window, and he looked. All he could see was what he thought was spilled red wine. So he thought she blew him off. Then he got back in his car and took off. Ashley laid there for almost 12 hours, over 35 stab wounds to her chest, to her head. There was stabbing, there was ripping, there was mutilation. When they found her body, it was nearly drained of blood. It's awful. It's real. I'm actually going to have nightmares, for real. One of the most unfortunate facts about this case is that if Kutcher showed up 30 minutes earlier, he would have picked up Ashley and they would have gone to their party and all would have been fine. Or, fortunately, he didn't because he could have run into the killer. Right. Ashley's body was found the next morning about 9 o'clock by her roommate, Jen DeSisto. Jen and Ashley's best friend, Chris Duran, have agreed to meet with us and we're going to meet at one of Ashley's favorite Hollywood night spots. This is a landmark. This is Bordner's Bar. It's been here since 1942, and almost every serious drinker in Hollywood has visited Bordner's at one point in time. So let's go check it out. Hi, Chris. Hey. Scott, nice to meet you. This is Danielle. Tell us about uh, Ashley and how you became acquainted with her. Um, I met her through her roommate at the time who lived in the house. He introduced me to Ashley, and we just became best friends, like, instantly. Can you, in your own words, describe Ashley the way that uh, she was? She was just beautiful. She was, like, spontaneous. And, like, just spur of the moment, we would jump in the car and go do something. Um, just a beautiful soul. Sorry. Um, well, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. There was an incident with a car. Yes. Can you explain what happened? Coming up, we hear a chilling tale of the first encounter between Ashley Ellerin and this man, the alleged Hollywood Ripper. Next on Hollywood Death Trip. I'm taking Scream Queen Danielle Harris on an exclusive tour of sensational Hollywood deaths. We're on our final case, Ashley Ellerin who, on the night she was murdered, was minutes away from being picked up by Ashton Kutcher for their first date. You and Ashley may have interacted with her alleged killer. Yes. Can you explain what happened? I pulled up one day, early afternoon, and parked my car, got out, went inside. Ten minutes later, I walked out, and my tire was flat. I really didn't think anything of it. So as I'm changing my tire, this guy started walking down the street, and he offered help. We all started talking. He um, introduced himself as Michael and um, gave us his, not his business card, but a business card. He was a heating and air conditioning repairman. You know, he was good looking. Ashley was gorgeous. They were flirting with each other. And um, he left. And shortly after that, um, our heater in the house broke. I'm like, yeah. oh, we just met this we guy met that, this like, heating guy. the heating and air conditioning guy, let's call him. So he came, fixed the heater in, like, 10 seconds. Oh, so you think he may have done something? Yeah. I actually I do think I definitely that. think that he flattened my tire, and right. I definitely think that somehow he gained access to the house and, and sh did something to the heater so we would call him. Well, and then, you know, you call someone to do a favor that you just met, and it's like, yeah, you just start hanging out with him. And he would just show up at parties, and, and it just started being really 
weird. So did she get uncomfortable around him? I don't think Ashley got a, uncomfortable around anyone. I had read somewhere that he told, uh, was it Ashley or you, that he was uh, being investigated for another yeah, murder? Yeah, he, he had come to the house one day and said that he was, um, there was Chicago FBI at his apartment wanting to get some DNA samples about a murder from long ago. And I just remember thinking, if you have nothing to do with it, like, why, why run? It turns out it was Patricia Ficascio mm -hmm. right. um, when she was, I think, 16. And that whole thing is It was just it was yeah. a tragic story. And that's when it, everything about him started just creeping us out. Jen, can you tell us how you discovered Ashley's body? I can. I got there, and I went up the stairs, opened the door, and when I looked over, she was laying across the two stairs, you know, like covered in blood. And with it. But to me, it seemed like covered in a color or something was like a joke. So I kind of walked up toward her. And then I, I realized that this was definitely not a joke. And then I got freaked out that someone might still be there. So I just ran out and called for my cell phone. That morning, I got a phone call from our friend Jack. And he told me that Ashley was dead. So how soon after this happened did you kind of go, oh, I think we know what happened? It took a really it long time. It took a really long time. I think after he was caught, the it detectives It was actually called, the detectives that were detectives really so on the case in. there. What phenomenal man. Every couple of years, we would get phone calls and like some, some break in the case or something. But in 2008, when he was actually caught and when they called us in and started asking us about him, Everything just kind of falls into place, and you're like, oh, my god. The suspected Hollywood Ripper is 37-year-old Michael Gargiulo. He was arrested in 2008 and charged with the murders of Ellerin and two other women, as well as the attempted murder of a third. He has pled not guilty and is still awaiting trial. It was really the most horrible thing ever. Um, I was on the stand in the preliminary hearing for, I don't know, two or three hours. It was terrible. The entire time, he was just staring at me, mm -hmm. like, if I ever get out of here, I'm going to kill you. It was the most horrible thing, aside from the murder of my best friend. It was right. the hardest thing I've ever right. had to go through. And but you had I, to do I, it for I, her. Exactly. I can't not tell her story. I lost my best friend. It was so pointless. She was a great person. Nobody deserves this. Coming up, Danielle and I visit the new home of Michael Gargiulo, the alleged Hollywood Ripper. So realistically, he could be looking at us right now. Next on Hollywood Death Trip. The suspected Hollywood ripper Michael Gargiulo waits to have his fate decided in a court of law. Now we're taking a detour to see the place he currently calls home. It's one of the most seedy and sinister corners in the entire city. This is the Twin Powers Correctional Facility, the uh, LA jail, and there is bad in there. Bad people that did bad things are in that building. It's probably the most evil area of Los Angeles. You can see there's not much to do around here except visit a prisoner or be a prisoner. Since 2008, Michael Gargiulo has been behind those walls awaiting trial for allegedly killing Ashley Ellerin. And he's already tried to escape. So he's there, he's there right now? He's right there. So realistically, he could be looking at us right now. I think he is, look. I know, that completely freaks me out. I think it's time to wrap it up. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Sleep tight. <laughs> Home. So what did you think of your tour? <laughs> Aww, it was uh, really fun and really freaking frightening. Right. So thanks. I'm not going to sleep tonight or tomorrow <laughs> night. <laughs> Always remember, death is a trip, but it's a living. It is a living. See you later. Bye, Danielle. Take care. <laughs> Walk me to 
my car. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your fault. I'm freaked out.